Uh, so just to kind of jump right in, uh, I'll give a quick outline of, of the presentation. Uh, so I'll start with uh, traditional product development or waterfall product development and why that approach is no longer sufficient. I'll then jump into kind of the core of the presentation around lean product devel development uh, and what I think of as making sure we're building the right product as well as building the product right. Uh, and then I'll end with some, some final thoughts. Uh, so traditional product development usually looks something like this, uh, which many of us are familiar with, uh, starting with an initial idea that comes from an executive or someone within the company uh, is then passed off to a PM or a business analyst role to gather requirements, put together a business case, try to put some numbers around uh, projections of what the cost of the project is and what the benefit is to the company. Uh, and then it's handed off to design to come up with some mocks. Designers hand it off to the development team after a lengthy development QA process. It's finally released uh, to customers. Um, so this is probably something very familiar to, to most of us in the room. Uh, there's a number of problems with this uh, approach, though. Uh, for one, most ideas inherently are going to fail, uh, and there's very little validation of the ideas in, in traditional product development. Uh, it's generally too early to predict any kind of cost or revenue projections with a, a, a high level of accuracy. And so a lot of companies fall into a false sense of progress because they're measuring output instead of outcome. And so a lot of product teams can kind of pat themselves on the back uh, simply because they release something into production. Uh, but that's not really a great way of measuring uh, progress or success for, for a product. Uh, design and engineering teams are brought in too late. There's very little collaboration. Uh, there's also silo teams. Uh, and so things are kind of thrown over the wall uh, which is typical of waterfall. Uh, customer validation happens too late uh, because you're not putting a product in front of customers until uh, the end of the, the product life cycle. Uh, and after the product is released, it's usually deleted, the feature is deleted, or the product is deprecated because of lack of usage. Uh, and after a few times of this happening, uh, obviously this is very demoralizing for the team because they feel like they're working on products that uh, no one wants, essentially. And so one of the major uh, flaws of, of this approach is that you're not validating the product or the ideas with, uh, with customers. Uh, and in fact, one of the top reasons that startups fail, and not only startups, but products uh, of, from companies of any size, uh, the, one of the reasons they fail is that there's no market need for uh, the product itself. And this is very risky uh, from a product development standpoint uh, because, as I mentioned before, you're not validating ideas or the product with customers until very late in the process. And so you never uh, figure out if the problem was worth solving in the first place. Uh, you never figure out if anyone actually wanted the product in the first place. And also you incur the opportunity cost of something else that you could have been working on and developing uh, that you missed because you were building this product uh, that no one wants. And so there has to be a better way, and that way is lean product development. Uh, and so this is kind of how we think about product development uh, from a pivotal standpoint. Uh, so lean product development combines these three areas uh, or core disciplines of lean startup, user-centered design, and agile development to deliver a successful product. And so I see lean startup and user-centered design as making sure we're building the right product and building features that our customers and, and users will value, and then agile development as building the product in the right way in a sustainable manner uh, and able to you know, support the user-centered design and, and lean uh, startup uh, practices. And each of these disciplines warrants its own talk or presentation, really. So what I'll try to do today is just give a, a very high-level overview of each of the areas and uh, kind of leave you with some additional resources if you're interested in, in learning more. Uh, so going into the, the first area of making sure we're building the product right, uh, the Lean Startup uh, is an, a, a management approach um, that was brought forth by, by Eric Ries. And just to kind of clarify a point that uh, a lot of companies have questions around, um, in the book, Eric Ries defines a startup as any institution that is creating products under conditions of extreme uncertainty. 
And so a lot of uh, clients will, will come to us and say, you know, how is this relevant to me? How is lean product development or the lean startup relevant to me? Uh, and it's actually relevant to companies of all size. Uh, in this definition of a startup, there's explicitly no mention of company size. And so startups, as well as entrepreneurs, certainly do exist uh, within companies of all sizes, even large enterprises. Uh, but essentially, what the Lean Startup prescribes is creating small products uh, to prioritize and, and test assumptions and getting product in front of customers as quickly as possible to use uh, user and customer feedback to then iterate and evolve the product uh, and ensuring you're delivering uh, something that's valuable uh, to customers. Uh, another you know, main component of Lean Startup is reducing waste. And one of the biggest forms of waste is to design, build, and develop a product that ultimately no one wants. And so we want to avoid that as much as possible. And the way we do that is through the build, measure, learn uh, cycle. And so as you saw in Lean, or uh, sorry, traditional product development, it's very linear. Um, and uh, you're you know, waiting to, to release product to customers until far down the life cycle. Uh, in Lean Startup, we want to go through this continuous loop of learning um, and iterating until we get to a product that customers actually want. And so you start with prioritizing critical assumptions uh, around your ideas, getting to understand your customers, getting real product out in front of them, and then adjusting direction uh, based on actual evidence as opposed to opinions. And again, just to draw back to uh, the, the graph I had before, uh, where you're accumulating risk over time with traditional development. Uh, in the lean approach, we want to have smaller releases, and so we're consistently de-risking the product by going through this, this feedback and this cycle of, of continuous learning. And so to give uh, a small example of that uh, using donuts, because I happen to enjoy donuts, like most people, um, so, you know, the Lean Startup, you have this concept of, a, of an MVP or minimum viable product. And essentially what that is, is the minimum thing that you can put in front of customers to start to, to learn um, and validate and test your assumption. And so before you start adding sprinkles and icing on, onto your donut, you want to learn, you know, if your customers prefer cake donuts or yeast-based donuts or chocolate donuts. Uh, and so to give a more concrete reward example, uh, I refer to a company uh, called money.net. And if you're not familiar with uh, this company, um, they're disrupting a, a market that has been owned by Bloomberg and, and Thomson Reuters uh, for over 20 years. Um, if you're not familiar with Bloomberg machines, those are those fancy terminals that you see in Wall Street movies with fancy charts and, and, and graphs. Uh, the machines are very expensive, something on the order of $25,000 uh, per license, per terminal, uh, per year. And so this entrepreneur had a hypothesis that uh, traders would actually prefer a comprehensive software platform that could be used uh, on any device uh, over a terminal. And also that there was a large untapped market at a lower price point because there's only so many banks that can afford a $25,000 uh, per year terminal. And so instead of going straight into the build phase uh, of the product development life cycle, uh, what this entrepreneur did was actually put together a PowerPoint uh, featuring uh, screenshots of what the product would actually look like. And he was able to put this in front of customers and start to get feedback. And he used that to inform uh, building the actual product and validate that there was actually a demand for this product. Uh, and he had very uh, great reception from customers. Not only did they want to sign up to buy it, they actually wanted to help him uh, and spread the word uh, about the product. And so this is an example of a company uh, that was able to react to what customers were explicitly asking for as opposed to guessing what the customers wanted. OK, so moving on to uh, the next uh, sort of core discipline around user-centered design uh, is pretty much exactly what it says, where you're designing the product around how the user can and wants to use the product as opposed to uh, forcing uh, forcing the product onto the user and trying to change uh, their behaviors. And one of the key, uh, key pillars of, of user-centered design is that this is a way of adding value for the business. It's not just about making customers happy, but there's actually a positive uh, loop of reinforcement where happy customers actually lead to, to business success. Uh, Reid Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn, actually has a theory uh, related to this, even though he doesn't explicitly mention user-centered design. And his theory is that before you can build a scalable company, you have to do things that inherently do not scale. And one of them is crafting a hand, building a handcrafted 
core experience around your users uh, one by one and really uh, narrowing in on your users' needs and their problems, defining solutions that are handcrafted to them, and then shifting to a more of a scaling mindset, which is a completely different approach to more of this one-on-one -on -one handcrafted experience. And uh, I think a, a great example of a company that has executed on this extremely well is, is Airbnb. Um, everyone's familiar with Airbnb. Uh, they're disrupting the travel and hospitality industry, $30 billion valuation, 100 million plus users, uh, extremely uh, large global market opportunity. Uh, but they didn't start at 100 million users. They started with just 10 users and really trying to craft uh, the, uh, the core experience around these 10 users. Uh, and their founding story is very well documented. Uh, they went through Y Combinator. The founders have given you know many interviews, and, and Y Combinator uses them as um, an example of you know one of their their top companies. If you're not familiar with Y Combinator, they're a startup accelerator. They invest and in kind of help entrepreneurs get their companies off the ground. And uh, the founder of Y Combinator, Paul Graham, is uh, known for asking founders these sort of deceptively simple questions, but that are very profound. And so. He asked the founders of Airbnb, you know, where are your, where's your business, where are your users? And in the early days, Airbnb didn't have very much traction, but they did have a few users in New York. And so Paul's response, well, well, why are you here in Mountain View? You should go to your users, go to New York, get to know them one by one, and build that handcrafted experience. And so the founders really took this uh, advice to heart and actually flew uh, to New York and would knock on their users' doors one by one. Uh, and they say like they didn't just meet their users, they actually went and lived with them. They would actually sleep on their couch, uh, get to know their, their problems, ask them questions, and really develop empathy uh, for their, their customers. And I think that really epitomizes user-centered design. It's like developing that, that empathy, really understanding your customers' problems, uh, and designing solutions around them. And the, one of the founders, Brian Chesky, kind of jokingly says, you know, when you bought an iPhone, Steve Jobs didn't come sleep on your couch, uh, but I did. Uh, so that's more of an extreme level of empathy, maybe not uh, what most you know, companies would, uh, would look to do, uh, but certainly a great example of a company that was able to, to really lock down a handcrafted experience and then scale that to become a, a very successful business. Uh, so for the final uh, pillar of lean product uh, development, I'll talk about making sure we're building the product right from an agile development standpoint. Uh, so agile development gives us a set of values and principles uh, for building software, and I won't go into each of them uh, specifically. Uh, there's certainly more information on agilemanifesto.org if anyone's interested in sort of reading detail about the principles and values, but most of them center around iterative de delivery, flexibility and being responsive to change, teamwork, and uh, communication. Uh, and so one, uh, one of the practices uh, of Agile, maybe one of the flavors of, of Agile that we practice here at, at Pivotal uh, is known as extreme programming. And among many other things, uh, extreme programming prescribes uh, short iterations, pair programming, test-driven development, and continuous integration and delivery. And this essentially allows us to support the first two pillars of uh, lean startup and user-centered design and making sure that we can build software in a responsive manner and be adaptive and flexible to change, but also deliver a quality uh, product and, and code. Uh, and so, for example, uh, this company, Wealthfront, uh, which is an automated investing company, they manage over $4 billion in technology, is really at the core uh, of what they do. Uh, they, they're very sophisticated in their engineering practices. And actually, if you go on their website, uh, you, can, you can read more about this. They actually have a, a dashboard where you can see their latest push to production. And so they're pushing to production uh, sometimes more than 12 times uh, per day. And so a lot of companies will say, you know, oh, we're, we're operating in an industry that is you know, historically risk averse or highly regulated. And so this is an example of a company that is operating in a highly regulated industry, but still able to adopt agile practices and deliver uh, value for their customers. Uh, and so just for uh, some, some final thoughts, uh, Charles Darwin, the, the godfather of, of evolution, was quoted as saying, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. And uh, I won't digress into evolutionary theory, but I think that is applicable to uh, to businesses today as well. 
because the competitive advantage has shifted from being the best in the world at a particular thing to being the most adaptable to evolving uh, markets and customer needs. And lean product development allows us to do uh, just that. Uh, but as a final point, I want to reiterate that it really takes all three disciplines to be able to deliver a successful product. Uh, and so in a lot of companies you see, uh, they may have adopted agile uh, principles, but maybe they, they didn't adopt user-centered design or a lean startup. So then you run the risk of building the product efficiently, uh, but you sh you're still not validating with customers, so you still run the risk of uh, delivering a product that, that ultimately the market doesn't want, or vice versa, right? If you have you know, only user-centered design, maybe you have you know, some sort of a customer feedback loop, but you're not able to translate that into business value because you don't have the other two uh, components. Uh, and so that's pretty much the end of the, the presentation. Um, we'll kind of leave it there and open up for any questions from anyone or just feedback in general. Thanks. Or not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so uh, I have yet to try that in, in practice. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to kind of put together this presentation was to help uh, form my own thinking around this topic uh, and really kind of think through this uh, from a personal standpoint. Uh, so definitely on my last project, I think it would have been nice to be able to have this conversation or present this information uh, to our client because uh, I think they, they were in the situations where I talked about one of you know, some companies have you know, one pillar, but they don't, they're not as sophisticated from a product or design standpoint. Uh, and I think a lot of our clients probably come to us right in. They've heard of Agile, they've heard of MVP, they've heard of some of these topics, but um, may not be as sophisticated um, in, in, in regarding to uh, lean product development. And so I think it would have been, been great to have this conversation, uh, but yeah, I haven't had this conversation with, directly with a client yet, so. TBD.